Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar on the JUMP GAF Call for Innovation in Roofing Systems. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items just so you know how to participate in today's event. You're listening in using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and dial in information will be displayed. You also have the opportunity to submit uh, text questions for today's presenters. Uh, you can do that just by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. And you may send in your questions at any time during the presentation and we do encourage you to do so. Uh, and we'll collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. And finally, we'll be sharing a recording of the presentation along with the PowerPoint file with everyone in attendance today. You'll receive both in a separate email, which I'll send out shortly after we wrap up here. I would now like to introduce our three panelists. First is Melissa Lapsa. She is the Technology to Market Subprogram Manager at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and she has also led the JUMP program since its inception in the spring of 2015. Also from Oak Ridge is Andre Desjardins. He is the lab subprogram manager for the Building Envelope Research Program. And Andre has been involved in building envelopes and materials research for over 40 years. The last 25 of those have been with Oak Ridge. And rounding out our panel is Helene Hardy Pierce. Helene is the vice president of technical services, codes, and industry relations for the GAF Corporation. Uh, Helene has spent over 36 years in the roofing industry, and she's been active in many of its organizations, including her current chairing of the PIMA Board of Directors and Directorships of SPRI, RCMA, and the RCI Foundation as well. We'll now get things started with uh, an overview of the JUMP program, which will be provided by Melissa, uh, and that'll be followed by a discussion of the specific challenge itself uh, with Helene. Uh, so, Melissa, I turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Tyler. And thank you, everyone, for participating in our webinar this afternoon. We don't anticipate taking the whole hour because we want to open it up at the end to answer any questions that you've typed in. So uh, please let us know along the way uh, what questions you have for this program. Next slide, please. So if you're, you're not familiar with JUMP, it's a tech-to-market initiative uh, sponsored by the U.S. Department of Energy Building Technologies Office, and it stands for, JUMP stands for Join in the Discussion, Unveil Innovation, Make Connections, and Promote Tech to Market. And our goal is basically to facilitate um, getting innovative ideas to technical challenges being faced in the buildings industry today. And um, it is a wonderful opportunity to hear from people that we don't normally hear from um, on innovative solutions. And the goal is to connect these innovative solutions from people on the phone and around the U.S. Uh, to help our industry partners uh, move the needle in, in energy efficiency um, in a cost-effective, time-efficient manner. Um, and the website is jump.ideascale.com. And there you'll see all of our past challenges as well as the, the three current uh, active challenges, including the one that we're talking about today, GAFs. Next slide, please. So we cover a variety of different building technologies. Uh, right now, we have two focusing on building envelopes, including the GAF call, um, and we also have um, one on heating and cooling systems live right now. And the process is that we launch the call, and um, we have a time period where um, the audience or people visiting the website can review it, submit their ideas, and we have a deadline, usually just a couple of months after it's posted because we want to keep all of these calls fresh. We have a deadline. Uh, people can go online and submit ideas. Also, they can discuss ideas that are out there and vote um, on ideas that they like. And then we have a voting deadline, and we have a panel of judges that evaluates all of the great ideas that are posted online. Um, and those judges uh, typically uh, consist of at least three participants, uh, one a technical expert from Oak Ridge National Lab, a technical expert from the industry partner, and a third party. Uh, typically that is from the Department of Energy or university um, or another uh, partner. And um, then finally, when the, the winning idea is selected, um, we announce the winner, and, and then we enter into a phase where we're trying to advance the concept uh, to the marketplace. Next slide, please. 
So since 2015, we're pleased that we have had 13 industry partners on 15 different challenges, and um, we have uh, had our winning winning ideas receive uh, submitters receive cash awards up to $5,000, um, and several of them have worked with ORNL uh, on to get. Uh, receive technical support and working with the industry partners to move those concepts closer to the marketplace. Um, in addition, our winners have looked for other funding opportunities and we're pleased one uh, partner, one uh, small business who was a, had a winning idea received 120000 via the Small Business Voucher Program from DOE this year. Um, and also um, another winner uh, was awarded fifty thousand uh, dollars for further technical evaluation of their technology from the Federal Energy Management Program. Next slide, please. So all of the the winners you can find on our website if you click on the the winners um, tab at the top of the website. Um, I just highlighted one uh, winner here. Um, recently who uh, has been a success story, Benjamin Knob, and um, he came up with a solution to A.F. Smith's technical challenge, which was using a 50-gallon water heater, deliver an equivalent amount of hot water as one with a 65 or 80-gallon tank without increasing the water storage temperature. And so he had a very innovative idea uh, using phase change material in the tank. Uh, and he won that award and received $5,000 cash award from A.O. Smith. Uh, he also received technical support from ORNL, and he has a patent pending, and he's uh, nearly completed his initial prototype of this system that he has uh, came up with. Next slide, please. Um, I often get the question about intellectual property. How does that work with this program? So this is a public website, so we uh, encourage everyone who um, has an innovative idea, if they want to protect it, to do that before they put that idea out onto the website, because of course once it's on the website, it's out for public consumption. Um, however, that the innovator that is their idea, um, our project partners involved with the program um, would only um, discuss uh, joint intellectual property if, after the, the idea is selected as a winner, uh, the industry partner or the lab would add to the idea through, through uh, technical collaboration. So um, th that is just a brief overview of the intellectual property question, but um, if you want more information, um, you'll find that on our website in a variety of places, including the um, the terms and conditions that as a registered user of the website, you would need to click that uh, you accept those terms and conditions before you begin submitting ideas to the website. Next slide, please. So with that brief overview of the program, I'm excited to turn it over to Helene, who is going to tell you more about this specific challenge that is on the website um, for the next month or so. So Helene? Um, thank you very much, and um, and thank you very much for the introduction earlier. So my name is Elaine Hardy Pearson. I'm with GAF. Um, next slide. And and what we're going to try to do this afternoon is really explain the challenge, and and hopefully we have some folks on the call who maybe aren't that familiar with with roofing. And um, it's nice we're within the building envelope, so that's why this challenge is in in that bucket um, in with the whole jump program, and it's. The roof we some people consider is the fifth wall, and specific um, to roofs is we have to have something to build our roof on, or build a roof on, and so concrete decks and and a lot of people who have spent a lot of time in this industry for years, you know, many of us would say a concrete roof deck is probably one of the best decks you can get because it's stable, it can take weight, it you know doesn't necessarily deflect, especially if it's well designed. Um, and for a myriad of other reasons. However, um, what's happened is some of the ways and means in which concrete decks are constructed have changed. And they are poured in place. Their concrete itself is poured with a lot of water in it. And um, typically what we've always done is required a 28-day cure period. And then we, the roofing contractor um, and or others would test the deck for dryness. And it was a surface test. And then we'd say, OK. It's ready to roof. 
Now, you'll see through the slides today a little bit of interchange changing going on between lightweight structural and structural concrete. This um, call for innovation really doesn't um, discriminate between the two. We just say moisture in concrete. So let's leave it that it's open. It's wide open for solutions. Um, however, the problem of moisture in concrete really has become um, rose to the attention of being causing concern due to also the increased use of lightweight aggregate in structural concrete. We're not talking about lightweight insulating concrete. We're talking about lightweight aggregate being used in structural concrete. It actually can hold more water. So when we're pouring concrete, we even have that much more water. Um, and so one of the problems is, is that combined with the increase in use of lightweight aggregate, there also has been a move to pouring concrete over non-removable forms. Traditionally, you pour it over a removable form, you remove them, and the concrete, the moisture, water would just dry out going upwards in the winter and downwards and being handled actually by the um, um, HVAC system um, in the interior use space. Next slide, please. So next slide now, finally, that was a long introduction. But all of it is suffice to say that we have a deck that's poured with water. The water can remain in the deck. Um, certain um, means of construction have changed which is accentuating the potential to have water remain in the deck. And then we want to put a roof on it. And so when we look at the roofing system holistically in its entirety, these are the problems that, and it's not specific to a wet concrete, any wet deck, but in this case, a wet concrete deck, um, it's a problem we don't know when the roof is ready. I mentioned surface, surface tests, um, but if you have a four or six inch or eight inch or thicker, concrete deck, it's very difficult to tell how much water is actually contained within the structural deck itself. Um, and then a, a large one is, is that typically the industry is considered these decks, we would adhere the roofing system, um, including insulation directly to the deck. So now I'm trying to adhere to something that may send water up into the roofing system, causing loss of adhesion. Um, it, a lot of insulation facers, if they get wet, become damaged and um, they do not remain adhered to the, to the insulation core. Um, obviously, wet and insulation don't usually go well together, loss of R value. Um, and then we go on down to you can have um, bad things growing in your roofing system when you give it a water source combined with potentially organic materials that provide a food source. Um, Water-based adhesives used primarily um, both with insulation on the single ply roofing side can re-wet and then they're not doing such a great job of adhering the roofing system. And then obviously any type of ferrous material in the presence of water has the potential for corrosion. Next slide please. So those are all reasons about why we care and we not being collectively GAF, we being collectively the roofing industry and it is an industry concern. Um, there are several, if you're not that familiar and you're, you want to get, you know, some more information, there are several technical advisories that have been issued to raise awareness um, from the NRCA, the National Roofing Contractors Association, from the Asphalt Roofing Man Manufacturers Association, and then a collective piece that was co-authored by SPRY, representing single ply roofing industry. Um, the Polyiso Inflation Manufacturers Association and the Roof Consultants Institute. And so if you go to these and then others, um, several manufacturers, um, ourselves included, have issued technical bulletins specifically providing their recommendations of attempting to avoid problems with these decks. Next slide, please. So what is the challenge? Um, when we first started trying to get our heads around this is an industry problem and it would be great if we had some people that, that really could think outside of our box. And, um, and so we really, hopefully the way that this challenge is worded doesn't limit anyone who might be pondering solutions. It's not meant to. Um, it really is, um, it could be materials, it could be installation methods. Um, to, with concrete decks, to reduce the likelihood of having moisture related problems, which hopefully that doesn't bookend anyone or constrain um, 
their creative thought processes. Um, it is really meant that, and so I would throw out, I threw out to someone and they just kind of looked at me, but I said, imagine if you had water, you know, if you had removal, if you had forms, not removable, but you had forms that disintegrated over time. So all that water could be handled by the HVAC system in the building. So, and they just kind of looked at me like, oh, okay, Helene. So, but that's what I meant. This, the challenge is not meant to constrain. It truly is to reduce the likelihood of having problems caused by moisture. Next slide, please. So, um, for those who are not necessarily um, roofing, roofing folks, um, we, I did want to take a little bit of time to, to just throw out some things for consideration. And the nice thing about this webinar is, is that the slides will be available afterwards and so you've got all of these bullet points. So let's, let's look at them. The first is vapor drive. You know, structural concrete or concrete is used within the construction of a building in a whole bunch of places. You know, walk up and down the stairs, the stairwells of many buildings and you'll see um, oftentimes poured concrete steps. Um, oftentimes the floors are concrete between levels um, and on and on. What is different about a roof deck or um, presents a different type of challenge because some people say, well, just treat it like a floor. You know, we put a sealer on it and then we don't worry about it. Well, consider that the vapor drive when you have um, ambient conditions outside that could be zero and conditions based inside that's a significant, um, and so I, I said vapor drive, temperature differentially driven vapor drive. And um, it's very, very different than the um, movement of moisture within the interior space itself. So if I have a concrete floor between floors, between floors 13 and 14, you know, the temperature in, on floor 13 is probably pretty close to the temperature on floor 14. As opposed to a roof deck, like I said in the example, if when it's zero degrees outside and it's, you know, condition space 68 degrees inside, that drive is, remember, moisture is always seeking the cold side. It is up into the roofing system, which is why also this problem is more prevalent the further north that you go. Um, in more sunny or warmer climates, really warmer climates, not sunny, but in warmer climates, the vapor drive is to the interior. Even if it's poured over a non-removable form, the water in that concrete deck is just being driven to stay in the concrete deck. Um, the second um, kind of area that we maybe want to think about is the cost and ease of installation. The reason that the, the means and methods of constructing concrete roof decks has changed has you know, primarily been driven by changes in practice. And oftentimes those changes in practice are providing labor savings or installed cost savings. If I come up with a way, a form that I don't have to remove because I can construct it quickly and fast and I can pour and be moving and I'm moving my production schedule along very, very quickly, then to a general contractor and a concrete contractor, that may be more um, cost advantageous than removing forms the way it's been done in the past. So when we look at the um, cost of labor, the time, materials and methods, um, I put down construction scheduling and sequencing. Um, those are things that really should be taken into consideration um, when looking at the deck itself. Um, a third area is attachment methods for the roofing system. Um, our roofing systems, in addition to, to having to perform um, in all types of environments, um, from hot and cold to to from hot to cold to humid um, to dry, we regardless we need to get the roof in place, and that's when we have moisture that creates its own um, challenges, such as the corrosion of fasteners, and another is, is the ability to interfere with attachment using the adhesive. Um, likewise, another thing to consider is is that Someone may have, well, I have a way to, con to really hold that moisture within the concrete. If it's some type of sealer or something, um, you really might want to take into consideration the effect that that may have on however or whatever you're going to put on top of it for the roofing system. 
And then the last point, which is really something that after all these years in the roofing industry, um, people say I'm pretty good at reminding um, people about, but it is the, I call it the assessment of success and the high cost of failure. Um, roofs present um, really um, interesting um, challenges in themselves because we have an expectation that a roof should last a very long period of time. Some people say 10, which I think is pretty short. And then some people say 25, 30, 35, or longer years in service. And when we change or we come up with ideas to with change in our industry sometimes is there's a slow catch. And, and one of the reasons it's a slow catch is, is that the, a great idea may not show that it's not such a great idea for six or seven or eight years. And so anything that we can do, and, we've, and, and most manufacturers and, and researchers and, and people like Andre have spent a lot of time trying to figure out how we can quickly assess whether or not we, there will be a success. But it's that assessment of success is a challenge. And then the flip side of that is, is the cost of failure. And um, simply put, roofs are not inexpensive. And not only do you have the cost of failure and the, the removal and replacement of the roofing system itself, you know, there's also the high cost if water comes into the building because um, regardless of, of all the other things a roof is supposed to do, I always say its number one job is to keep water out of the, the conditioned space. So next slide. Um, now, why it's important. That simply, and this was in the, the, the jump call, 14% of low soap roofs utilize concrete roof decks. That's from a survey that the National Roofing Contractors Association, if I'm not mistaken, that's the source, that they conduct um, either annually or biannually. Um, certainly, moisture in roofing systems not only affect the roofing system's ability to perform, but if we consider that the roof is the fifth wall of the building and it also typically has a very high R value, if we wet that insulation when moisture is being driven into the roofing system during the cooler months of the year, then um, we really could end up with that fifth wall with very, very little insulating value. And so, and then finally, um, another reason that is very, very important is if the roofing system is not attached, you know, there's a significant exposure to property casualty loss. Next slide, please. Now, this is an interesting, um, I just want to put this in perspective. So GIF is sponsoring this call for innovation. Um, but this call is an industry issue. And it really, um, we're just trying to, to be a leader. And, and as a leader, we have a responsibility to help find solutions for those problems that we and our industry are facing. And innovation and solutions really help our customers roofing contractors, designers, and also property owners. And regardless of, of what people may think about the roofing industry, if you're not familiar with it, truly, I think at the core, our industry wants safe, energy efficient roofs that work. And we need to figure out how to use these decks as a platform. Um, as someone said to me recently, you know, someone else created this quote-unquote problem, but they've created what we're being handed to work with, and we're being left really to deal with it. So next slide. And if you're not familiar with GAF, um, we were founded in 1886. We are North America's largest manufacturer of commercial and residential roofing, and we're um, nearly $3 billion in sales. And um, in both, um, some people say low slope and steep slope are residential and commercial. Next slide. And if you look across the commercial product line, um, we offer many technologies from repair and maintenance and liquid applied through modified bitumen, built up roofing, and single ply or Everguard products. And in addition, we are an insulation manufacturer with three ISO insulation plants. And with that, I think I've outline the challenge, so I'll turn it back over to Melissa. Thank you so much, Helene. That was excellent. Very nice overview. 
Um, and just to summarize, you know, what you, the winning idea receives, um, there's a $10,000 cash award sponsored by JF, which is fantastic, and up to $20,000 of in-kind technical support from ORNL, depending on what that solution is and what the needs are. Um, and then we'll also, you know, be talking, as I mentioned earlier, about future opportunities to help move that solution into the marketplace working with JAF. Um, and there's also an opportunity to participate in the Cleantech Opens Accelerator program, and we've had a, a previous jump winner participate in that program, so that has been a great opportunity. Um, you do have time, so it's the call is not ending tomorrow. It's open until Sunday, August 27th, so there's over a month of time to almost two months to look through and think about ideas, do some research and you know see what other people there's already some ideas out on the website, but you can go to our website at jump.ideascale.com. If you have any questions, I'll, my email will be at the end. Um, so next slide please. You can email me at any time. I just wanted to show who our past partners have been um, on this slide here. Uh, we've had a lot of great industry participation and also a collaboration with other national labs in hosting calls for innovation. Next slide, the last slide I should say. And um, with that, I will turn it back over to Tyler to see if we've had any questions come in. But again, I encourage you to look at the website, look at past winners, um, look at the uh, ideas that are out there under the GAF call now and um, vote on those and comment on them if you'd like and submit your own ideas um, through August 27th. So thank you very much for participating and thank you Helene for uh, your great overview and we'll take questions now and also Andre Desjardins is available to answer any questions. So Tyler? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you Melissa and thank you Helene both. Uh, excellent overview as has been mentioned. Um, and as you did also mention, we're going to go ahead and get some of your questions that you submitted throughout this presentation. And just as a reminder, um, you can still submit questions uh, right now through the questions pane on your attendee control panel. Um, at any time, any question, be it about the program generally or about technical concerns with the challenge or anything at all that you might be curious about. Um, and Melissa, I think you were right when you mentioned uh, intellectual property as a common point of interest. So we have a gentleman who asked, uh, is the only way to protect your idea before submitting it by having a provisional patent, or are there other ways? So I guess the question is essentially, um, is it safe? Uh, should people feel comfortable submitting an idea, um, even if it's not, you know, in a, some sort of formal legal stage of protection, uh, be it a pre-patent or something along those lines? So that's a great question, and there is information on you know what steps to take under our terms and conditions um, but really I defer to this to the to the innovator the person who wants to submit their idea you know it's it's completely up to you what you'd like to do um, I would say you know a, a lot of the submitters um, you know just put their ideas out there if they if you know one thing I did want to mention that you know, if you want to protect it, obviously you can, um, but also, you know, you don't have to provide a whole lot of detail on the submission itself. So, um, you know, feel free to put as little information as, you know, you feel as long as it, as long as it addresses the challenge in enough detail that if there's follow-up questions, the judges um, are able to have enough information that they'll want to call you or contact you for additional details. So that does happen sometimes where, um, you know, people post a little bit of information and it intrigues the, the judges, but they might need a little bit clarity. Um, but the submitter may not want to provide a, all the details on the website. So um, as long as there's enough information to intrigue the judges that it might be uh, the best solution that's out there, um, then that is completely fine and the judges will reach back out to, to, clear, to try to get clarification or additional information as needed. Excellent. I think that's, that's exactly right. That's a great summary. Um, and I would just remind people as well that there is, um, when you, you would like to submit an idea, you can do so publicly. 
Um, and again, that would, as you might expect, that's viewable to any member of the general public who can uh, who just joins the website um, and can take a look around. You also have the option when submitting of uh, selecting a private option. And in that case, your submission would only be visible to moderators, um, to people affiliated with um, with Oak Ridge and, for example, Helene and Andre. Um, people party to the program only would be able to see your submission, any attachments, any pictures that you might provide. So that's also a possibility. But I do think that there is some advantage um, if you are at all comfortable submitting your idea publicly um, because you're able to get community feedback. Um, you know, we've had some lively discussions before and some thoughts occur maybe to other submitters or to community members that are, are beneficial. Um, you know, I don't want to, it's not at all the case that this, you know, we say it's a competition maybe on occasion, but for the most part we do view, as, view this as a community and that feedback has been found helpful by submitters in the past. Um, so I would suggest, as Melissa widely did, that you know, we don't need a full description or a full breakdown or schematics at, at this stage of, you know, initial entry. Um, just put enough in there so that we'll have a, a good idea of where you're going directionally and that, you know, it might seem promising. And then we can reach out privately afterward, um, the JUMP program, judges and, uh, and evaluators, and try to get more information via private channels, uh, more secure channels that obviously would not be publicly viewable. Uh, going back into the question file here. Um, is this competition, I guess this would be a question for you, Helene, is this competition for general roofing for houses or also skyscrapers uh, in cities? I guess getting at the scope of the challenge and what you're looking for. Um, well, generally here in the United States, houses are not constructed with concrete. So we're, this is the general is um, market is low slope, what we call low slope or flat roofs. So it could be a skyscraper. It could also be a Walgreens, you know, standalone corner store, or it could be a strip mall or a what it was some people, although big boxes don't usually use concrete. If we think about where concrete construction is, oftentimes it can be low-rise office buildings, or it can be another place that concrete is used is sometimes in coastal areas because of the wind <clears throat> wind requirements. Um, and then the other is on what I, I would call more permanent structures, which are typically government type in, um, structures, it, you know, police departments, you know, schools, hospitals, those types of buildings typically are where you'll see concrete roof decks. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, Helene. Um, and I think, let's see, this one, uh, I will direct this initially to you, Helene, um, but Melissa, feel welcome to jump in as well, kind of maybe touches on both worlds. Uh, Joseph asks if there are any constraints on how the cash award uh, being offered by GF uh, is used. So are there any, I guess, uh, conditions or, or restrictions associated if somebody were to be uh, deemed the winner of this campaign and, and granted that cash prize? No. No. I mean, this truly is a cash award. Um, Melissa, I, you can help me more with this yep. from yep. <clears throat> I, I completely agree. <laughs> yep, that's, a, that's exactly right. It's it's a play cash award. Okay, and uh, and I think there might, be, for example, uh, some of our previous winners, you know, they have the cash award, which as you as you both mentioned, you know, they've you know been free to do uh, or dispose of as they see fit. And then there's also um, the potential for in kind technical support uh, to be provided by um, the laboratory. In which case, you know, that would be a more collaborative effort. Uh, where there's some direction and back and forth, and uh, you know that might get more into um, you know discussions. But the cash award itself is, is um, comes with no such strings. Have I gotten that right, Melissa? Do you agree? That's absolutely correct. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Uh, let's see. So we have a question from uh, from Andre. Uh, when you get community feedback, can you alter your idea until the submission date? Um, I think if you don't mind, Melissa, I can feel that one. Yes, that is. Uh, that is absolutely possible, and we encourage you. You know, if you have any, uh, if you like, make any additions or changes at any point up until the submission deadline, you're absolutely welcome to go back into the system and edit your idea. And it's very straightforward. Uh, if you have any questions on how to do that or any sort of concerns about, you know, t technical matters, um, you can see at that that jump email at the top of the page, buildings crowdsourcing at ornl.gov. I'm on it for that mailbox, um, you know, daily. So any issues or questions or concerns along those lines, or the jump program itself, um, you know, anything at all. Please feel welcome to uh, to send your inquiries there. But yes, Andre, that is uh, you can edit your feedback anytime you like. Uh, question from uh, Jason is asking if multiple submissions can be made. Um, so I guess 
Helene, another question for you. If, uh, if one submitter maybe has multiple ideas they think would be worthwhile, do you have any objection to them sharing them all with you? Um, no, I, I don't. Although you might look, you might consider that if there are, things are linked, that it may be a more impactful sub submission that it that those be a submission. But I, I'll defer to Melissa with experience. I mean, if I have a solution that has five parts, it's it, it's the ability of the judges to see the um, entirety of the solution. It, they may see it better as at least you know parts one through three, and then four and five, as opposed to five or one big solution. If that makes sense. Yes, absolutely. I would agree with that. And you know, again, I. Um, let the audience know that if you want to look at, you know, past winners, you can go into that past winners tab on the website and see exactly what those winners put into their submission online and uh, take a look at that for reference. But, um, yeah, I agree with what Helene said. Okay. Great. Thank you both. Um, and I guess maybe maybe a type of follow-up question to that, um, at least procedurally, is uh, Someone's curious who ultimately chooses the winner um, and whether, you know, is that the community, the JUMP community uh, members, or is it the judge judging panel? How is that uh, responsibility delineated, I guess? Um, Melissa? Sure, to sure. That I'll one. take that one. Absolutely. Um, and I was going to mention part of this earlier um, when you were talking about, you know, the submission process. Um, and, of course, most of our submitters submit on that, that public website. Um, Tyler, did, you did mention the other option where you can submit it privately, but most do see the you know the benefit of having the the public forum for other um, website users to vote, comment on the ideas they're submitted. That's really a great benefit of the website. Um, but you know to add on to that, the judging panel decides um, who the winner is, and they're going to look at all submissions, private, public ones that have one vote, ones that have 50 votes. So um, don't worry if you submit an idea and you don't get a lot of votes on your idea. All ideas will be considered and evaluated. And again, they're being evaluated. I briefly touched on that on one of my slides for um, their novelty, their uh, potential in the marketplace, and you know their technical feasibility. So we're going to be looking at now, all of those, there's specific evaluation criteria that each of the members of the judge, I mentioned there's at least three judges per call for innovation, and they will follow up with the submitters if they need additional information, and we've been doing this for a couple of years now, and it's, um, you know, the process is, uh, you know, very standardized, and it's worked very well, and um, once a, a winner is selected, and, you know, there there could be a case where there is no clear winner, and that has happened, but most often than not, there is a clear winner identified, and um, Tyler typically will reach out to that winner um, to communicate that, and then we'll let everybody else know. You know, I'm sorry you didn't win this round, but you know, please look at other calls for innovation and keep those ideas coming. Perfectly said. Thank you, Melissa. Um, and she's absolutely right when she mentioned that um, you know don't feel like once you submit an idea, you're kind of out in the wilderness, and then you get a decision at some point. You know, down the road, we look at these ideas. Um, you know, and we, you, with some degree of discretion, can say, okay, you know, there's something here. We'll reach out, or you know, um, when Helene was discussing multiple submissions, if if we do see, for example, that one submitter has uh, has put through maybe two or three ideas that may or may not be related, you know, reach out to them as part of the verification process, or I should say, the uh, you know, the, the learning process, just to get a better idea of what that those intentions are, where they might be going. Um, so, feel welcome uh, to submit an idea. You know, any well, I guess. This touches upon our final question um, that I see in here, Elaine, um, maybe a bit. Do you, is there, do you have a preference on the degree of development or refinement that you'd like to see in a submission? So I'm guessing this person maybe means if uh, you know if an idea is closer or is purely conceptual, um, will you, is that something that you would accept? Uh, maybe even if it's on the vague or less defined side, or are you looking for submissions that are closer to being, um, you know, towards the, the prototype end of the spectrum? Or, you know, I'll, I'll let you speak generally how you would like to to that question. But that's a really, um, not to, not, no pun intended, but that's a challenging question. And the reason it's challenging is, is that, it, you know, you have to have um, 
execution to take a great idea and make it work, but that doesn't mean that you can't have a great idea. And this really is meant to, to you know, come up with, you know, ideas to solve a problem. So um, if there's technical merit and there's some thought that's been put into the feasibility, then I think it can be an idea. It does not necessarily a prototype. Or if there's, you know, any effort that's been put into the verification of, you know, the tenets of the idea. Um, and, and so let's take my off-the-wall, you know, thing about disintegrating um, forms that concrete could be poured over. So if somebody was aware of a material that would have the structural strength and, you know, so they provided some strength numbers and, you know, this is how long it takes until it disintegrates and this is, you know, a relative, um, you know, right now a cost is this, but if it was mass produced, it could be driven down, you know, by a factor of X, you know, then there's been some, some thought put into it. And that's about all that I'll say, which was a whole bunch of dancing around a, I don't think, I don't want to discourage any idea submissions. And so I didn't want to answer that by saying, no, it needs to be, you know, this great baked idea, because I don't think that that's the intent, intent of the jump call for innovation. So with that, though, I wanted Andre to chime in, because Andre um, has more experience with with jump calls, this is our first, my first, and probably can can lend a, a better, more precise answer. Andre. Well, yeah, I, you know, I think that the, uh, the the challenge here is is a very significant one. This is a, a a question that the industry has been struggling with for years and years, but I think. What we're hoping is that we've been myopic over the years and that somebody who's clever, who sees things from a different perspective can kind of come in and, and, and come up with a solution that has evaded all of us for, for many years. The, uh, the, the opportunity, uh, the, the potential energy savings and improvement of durability of buildings for this specific job call would, would I think, be substantial and I think would be uh, uh, a great improvement in the uh, uh, the quality and durability of our low slope roofing systems uh, throughout throughout the U.S. So uh, uh, hopefully we have some very clever people who can see beyond what we have seen for years and come up with a, uh, a cost effective solution to this to this issue. Well, thank you both. Uh, if history is any guide, at least I, I think there's a fair shot of that. Uh, the jump community, you know, you guys have uh, seen any number of great ideas, as Melissa touched on, and some of the, the slides on previous winners and ideas that have come through. So, uh, you know, over the last two years, I think there's, there have been a number of uh, worthwhile contributions. I think we, um, you know, every, we thank you guys for that, um, and I certainly expect to see that going forward. So, I think, looking at the screen, that about does it for questions. Uh, but again, if you have any that you'd like to ask, if you get the chance to now, or that occur to you later, um, please direct those to any of the resources that you see on the slide in front of you. The first one, I would probably suggest that top one, the building's crowdsourcing email address. Um, but I just want to thank our panel um, and everyone who attended today's webinar. Um, you will get a copy of this presentation file, the PowerPoint, and a link to a recording of this webinar itself, and that will be in a follow-up email that I will send out shortly. And uh, on behalf of Oak Ridge, GAF, and the JUMP program, I want to thank you for, uh, thank you one final time for joining us and we hope that the rest of your day uh, is great. So with that, I will give everyone back about 15 minutes of their time, and I uh, wish, wish you all the best of luck.